my name's Evan, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about what I'm calling fear and loathing of the world of email lists, which once upon a time were really nice and gentle and simple, and all of a sudden now it's totally screwed up. So I'm just going to go through my experiences working with uh, Linux Professional Institute, which, uh, which I'm a part of, and our efforts to try and do a good mailing. So LPI has about something on the order of a half million people around the world that have taken an LPI certification exam, which is a, lo a good number, but some of this dates back to 1999. And some of these email addresses are going to be stale, which is going to be a problem for reasons I'll get into in a moment. Uh, people move, they change jobs, and things bounce, but things sometimes get even worse than bouncing. So. Rather than slides, I'm just going to go through a bunch of tabs on my browser to give an example of some of the websites, uh, providing the screensaver doesn't go off. OK. I'm just going to need to keep doing that from time to time. Uh, anyway, so all I'm doing right now is this is the email that most of you see. When you get an email from GTA Log, this is the one that actually announces today's meeting. And so everything looks hunky-dory. And at the bottom of most of these, they have the information of here's where you got it, here's how you manage your subscription, and here's where you get the archives and that kind of thing. Now, traditionally, at least in the world we've been traveling, that is user groups and other organizations doing communications, Mailing lists are a very interactive thing. That is, somebody will post a comment, and somebody will post a reply, and somebody will post another thing like that. And before that, you get so many brackets of different levels of conversation that it's hard to track. And so a lot of that seems to have moved to real-time chat systems. But email still ends up being really, really popular. And it's especially now popular for doing communication blasts. That is, an organization says, we have a reason to send a message to everybody who's indicated they want to hear from us. And it could be a newsletter, it could be an announcement, it could be a press release. But email is increasingly less about a lot of interactive things and more about sort of email blasts. And so I'm going to concentrate on those because uh, this is the software right now that GTA Log uses which is called Mailman. I mean, there's a, there's a couple. This is one that is sort of tried and true. And there's a couple of different mailing lists that are simple. And they're very, very easy to admin. Uh, it's all open source software. And in fact, so if somebody clicks at the bottom of their page, they come to a, they come to a screen like this where they get to manage their subscription information. This is way, way more than most people need right now out of a mailing list system, in that people don't necessarily want archives. You send somebody a message, you hope that they respond, meaning you take to a web page or you go to a Facebook post or a Twitter post or something like that. So it's usually you send out a message, you're hoping to get, at very least, you're hoping people to open the mail, right? A lot of email just gets unopened, maybe thrown into spam bins, whatever. So as the people that are originating the message, and this is in the case of, of an organization like LPI or a club or anyone that's doing an announcement list as opposed to an interactive list, your goal, number one, is to have email that's interesting, have email that somebody wants to even open, and then your, 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 golden, your golden prize is people will open the mail and they'll respond to it by either going to a web page, taking a survey, entering, or some kind of response that you want to get back. And so the marketing world has just gone absolutely nuts with how to track you and how to send things out and how to put links into the responses so that they have very, very accurate measurements. This is not very difficult to do. In the last 10 years or so, this process of doing this has become simultaneously way easier and way more complicated for totally different reasons. And one of the reasons it's more complicated is because of this. So, um, so Europe has this thing called the GDPR. The GDPR means you have certain rights to privacy, and it also means you have the right not to be spammed. 
Canada has a very, very tough anti-spam law called CAN-SPAM, and it, and it has actually done significant monetary penalties against companies that have flouted those regulations. The regulations basically are all about consent. Anyone that tries to send you, sell you a mailing list of names that you can then mail blast is essentially illegal in practice, if not in theory. The idea of I'm going to mail, I'm going to buy a list of 200,000 email addresses in Canada and I'm just going to blast them, that is, you're going to get in trouble one way or the other. Right now, everything is consent based. Is there has to be, in, under Canadian regulations, there has to be some reasonable expectation that the person you're sending the message to, number one, knows who you are, number two, has some idea of why you're sending it to them, and number three, has a very, very easy way to get out if they don't want. So those principles are really, really important, and they have totally colored the way that people can do email blasts now. So you can't just go into Mailman and say, I'm going to load it up with a, with a couple of hundred thousand names that I just bought off of, uh, off tour somewhere and, uh, uh, and, and send it out to them. You will get in trouble if it's traceable to you. And yeah, there's lots of people that send spam and you just need to go into the spam mailbox of Gmail or whatever to see all this stuff you didn't ask for. But yes, number one, Gmail knows it's spam. They know where it's coming from. They know it's coming from known sources of spam. You don't want to be on that list of known sources of spam because that causes all sorts of problems. So in addition to the legal problems of running afoul of Canadian law and actually getting prosecuted or fined, there's also the non-legal things where the geek community gets after you and says, you're a source of spam, go away. I'm not going to talk to you anymore, and I'm going to tell other people not to talk to you. We'll get to that in a second. But so the GDPR, because it works uh, totally throughout Europe, it means if you're sending to anyone in Europe, you basically have to be GDPR compliant in order to be able to deal with them, uh, which effectively means anyone who's doing a global list, the moment you have one person on your list that's inside the EU, except maybe the UK in a couple of months, you're going to have to be compliant with this thing. Uh, and so what's happened is most of the world's mailing list software and mailers have come to be compliant with this. Even though it's technically just an EU regulation, they have enough sway in the world that if you're going to do something globally, you have to do something that works in the EU. But I'd also remind that although this is an EU regulation, the Canadian anti-spam laws are such that if you run afoul of the Canadian regulations, you're going to get fined, and people have been fined for sending a lot of email to people without consent. So um, here I am at LPI. We've got this mailing list of you know, hundreds of thousands of people that have taken our exams over the years, and we wanted to try and reach them. In our case, uh, to tell them that we're about to roll out a membership program. I talked about the LPI membership program at the GTA log last year, and I won't get into the details of it, but this is a significant change that we're about to announce. Anyone who's got an LPI certification is eligible to become a member. This is an announcement that we want to tell our community about. Easy peasy. Just go to all those email addresses and send them a message. No. Okay. So uh, I'll go through some of the choices. Um, First of all, although I didn't put up the link, there's a couple of self-hosted open source mailing list uh, software projects. One is called PHP List. And so we, have, we do our own hosting for various things at LPI. So instead of Slack, we use Mattermost and we self-host it. And so there's a number of things that we do internally with hosting. And we figured, well, why don't we just host our own mailing list software? Easier said than done. Uh, there's two. The one that we selected and tried installed is called PHP List. It is essentially mailman on steroids and is geared to doing all those things I talked about in terms of managing a campaign. So in other words, you send out a message, it tracks back who, who opened it. Maybe send one, two, three. 
Not it, but not far. Just far enough. Anyway, so PHP list is a really good piece of software, but it doesn't do multiple languages. So here we were in LPI, we're around the world, we're delivering things in multiple languages, and PHP list simply could not. We actually went as far as hiring a coder to see if they could modify or fix the code in it for us. I mean, this is what you're supposed to do in open source. Get the software you can, and if it doesn't do exactly what you want, hire somebody to make the fix. Yeah? So what's, what's missing in the multilingualness? Is it the, the ability to have UTF-8? So, uh, no. Um, in this particular case, remember one of the things I said, as in order to not run afoul of spam logs, you have to make an easy way to unsubscribe. The unsubscribe message was always in English, no matter what the core message was. So I could write English, French, Spanish, Japanese. The unsubscribe message you would tack on to the bottom would always be English. Because that was boilerplate, and that's added on to the mailing system. Because the mailing list system has to handle the unsubscribes in a very, very seamless and easy method. You cannot put obstacles in the path of somebody who wants to unsubscribe. It has to be easy, or you're running afoul of the regulations. And in this particular case, we essentially had the coder give up on us. And so we, we, we paid one of the PHP list developers in the UK, come have a look, can you do this? And after a couple of months of thrashing around, we got to a you can't get there from here point, and we had to move on. So I'm about to get into some of the things that are hosted as software as a service, that are hosted on the web. But I just want to let you know that before we went this route, we really, really did try to implement our own open source solution. <laughs> Going through all the regular hoops that you're supposed to do. Get the code, and if you don't like it, change the code. So how it's supposed to work, in this case, it just didn't. So I'm about to take you through our trek through multiple different online hosted mail systems, some of which are extremely popular and you probably know, and I'll explain why they worked, why they didn't, and where we ended up. OK. First one is the one you probably have all heard of. OK, MailChimp. MailChimp is to not stretch the similarly, you know, the 800-pound gorilla of the bulk email world. Um, and they've gotten into all sorts of things. So they're no longer just in email services. They go into all sorts of marketing fulfillment and things like that. But that's how they started. If you wanted to say, I have, I'm a store and I have 1,000 customers and I want to email them. And that's, they, they have a really, really easy way to do it. And they even have free accounts. So that if you've got a small list and a small system, it works very well. Most of these, most of these systems work in a very similar way. You have multiple lists of names and you have multiple campaigns. So a campaign is, I have this message to send out. First you compose the message, and then you determine which of your lists it's going to get sent to. Most of them pretty well work that way. But can anyone guess, without reading my next tab, of why we didn't choose MailChimp? Because of where it's hosted. When you're dealing with people around the world, you do not, or we chose by conscious, not to go in a US hosted site. Of, well, yeah. OK? Which is basically Canada to US, UK, Australia, and New Zealand. Sorry? Um, anyway, so they have a data sharing agreement between them for security slash terrorism slash just snooping on you for whatever the hell reason purposes. We just chose for whatever reason we did not want to be hosted here because we had people around the world. We have people that have taken the LPI certification in Europe, in China, in other places where they don't trust having a US hosted system. So just for the purposes of having a worldwide audience we chose we didn't want to do this. So this is why 
when I go to the MailChimp thing, I don't even have a login here. It was just rejected out of hand. <laughs> but I'm sure it looks very nice once you do log in and it has free accounts and everything. Uh, and if you're doing something super simple and you don't care about any government snooping on your 500 people in your mailing list, there's really no harm, no foul. And it's really easy to use. Okay, this was, num this was solution number two, MailJet. MailJet is hosted in France and it's very, very easy to use and it, did not, it was not particularly expensive. However, we actually went as far as doing a couple of campaigns with them and we found out that they in fact were even more stringent than we, and we expected. So for instance, remember how I talked about those RBL lists, right? The one thing you do not want to do, you do not want your domain or IP address to be on any of these. Because essentially, when you send an email, it's going to look up your domain or your IP address against one or more of these. Google uses them, a lot of mail forwarding uses them. And if you are in spam house, a lot of mailers are just not going to forward your stuff. How do you get on spam house, even though you're legit? You do things like this. You send to a 20 year old email address where not only has the person moved away and not used the address anymore, but the address has been so far out of use that it's now turned into a honeypot. That is, somebody has converted this real but ancient address into something that, well, anything that goes there must be spam. And so there are quite a few of them out there that some of these networks are actively using. Old addresses that once applied were legit, don't have a human being associated with them, and then after about a decade of, of unuse, somebody will claim and then say, the only stuff coming in here is spam. So what happens? We do our first test campaign in MailJet, and they say, um, we don't want to work with you because we went back to our list, some of which goes back to 99, which to us includes a whole lot of people that took LPI certifications. Many of them are no longer at their email addresses. Many of them are, have been away for so long that they got turned into honeypots. And you don't need many of them to get on these guys' bad side. So in other words, we had half a million addresses. I, I think it was closer to like 370,000. So we had hundreds of thousands of email addresses. And out of them, maybe five of them were honeypots. That was above their bar. And so they basically go back to you and say, we need proof that these people gave consent. We need proof that for these, for these addresses and places, we need some kind of proof. Now, because these people had all taken LPI certifications, we had justification through the legal processes that we had a reason to try and reach them through the best way we had. But these anti-spam laws are not very old. Some of them are like five years old or less. So before five years ago, there was no concept of having to explicitly give consent for email. You probably went through a period of time a couple of years ago where every mailing list you were asked was asking you to confirm. Are you sure you want to be here? Are you sure you want to be here? That's because that's when the laws were kicking in for them. And if they didn't have your explicit consent, they couldn't send to you. And there were some grace periods and there were things like that. But this is still a very sensitive thing to do with all of the spam laws and trying to avoid being on those, our, on those black hole lists. And so we worked with them. And although we were able to clean things up, the relationship was still kind of weird. And they felt kind of weird with us. We felt kind of weird with them. And so we ended up moving away. I don't, it's not anything bad of them. If you want somebody that's really, really stringent about making sure that you, as a source of broadcast email, are not a spammer, these people will vet you. <laughs> And in fact, most of the sites, including MailChimp, 
MailChimp does not want to deal with spammers. It's not in their interest. It's not in the interest of any of these sites to actually work with spammers. And it's not in your interest to be known as one or else you'll end up in everyone's spam bin that in Gmail nobody looks at, which is the kiss of death if you're trying to reach people. So, uh, so I went into that and there's also web, there's even web pages on how to build your own honeypot if you have some unused email addresses. Here's how you can turn them into ways to catch those damn spammers. And when I'm an end user receiving stuff, I love this. When I'm somebody who's trying to broadcast a message out, this is, this, this is death if implemented the wrong way. But there's all sorts of information on the web about how these black, how these black holes are listed, how to get, you know, the appeal process to try and get off them once, taken on, once put on can be kind of onerous. So the real trick is not to be there in the first place. Anyway, so I wanted to show you. This is where we ended up. A website called Moosend, M-O-O-S-E-N-D. Now, being Canadian, I first thought moose. <laughs> the rest of the world thinks not, especially the people in India where this is based. So the hosting is based in India. Our payments seem to be clear through a bank in the UK. I don't care. All I know is they've been a blast to work with. I've been told in the marketing world that's actually a very high number. If you get more than one in three people opening a mail blast, uh, that's supposedly a really good number. And then out of those, <coughs> then out of those, then 8.2% of the total actually clicked the link that was in the mail to learn more, to see more, to do more, to enter the contest or whatever it is we sent people to at the bottom of the email. So usually campaign emails always have some kind of action at the bottom. You rarely get some kind of a broadcast email where it says, well, here it is, okay, bye. Usually there's some, if you want to know more, click here. If you want to enter a contest, click here. There's some kind of action that almost every campaign email asks you to do. Those are tracked. So for instance, if, if the thing at the bottom says, it looks on your screen like lpi.org, but it's actually rerouted to mailinglist.lpi.org, which is actually bounces to them, which helps them track us. So we can collect these stats. And so this shows over time, right? It's natural. At the very beginning when you send it, you have a very high open rate, and then over time it's down, 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 down. And so sometimes this is a curve. In this case, it was very sharp. So basically within, within from August 11th to August 18th, pretty well everyone that was going to open it opened it. After that, it didn't have much of a shelf life because it was for a specific conference and what's the point of opening it after the conference is done? <laughs> there's other things like newsletters that will have longer shelf life, right? So there's different things. There's announcements, there's newsletters, there's ongoing communications. So these, even though they're called campaigns, they will have different kinds of content to them. So this shows the last couple. So these, here's, here's the, the, the lists that we have. So here's the list, here's how many subscribers are on each. And so you can choose to each of these lists to send to a campaign. The list can have only a couple of hundred, the list can have a couple of hundred thousand. But the one thing that is really important to do is when you take your list, I have my list of 300,000 names and I import it to them. There are cleaning services that for a fee will go through your mailing list and pre-check them for bounces, pre-check them for being part of honeypots, pre-check them for all the things I was talking about. So for somebody that really wants to be a good player, they will send it through a cleaning service. And in fact, this particular site will not even let you import a list without it going through a cleaning service. Again, it's not in their interest to have spammers as part of their system. So at very least, you've done your due diligence. You've sent it to a cleaning service, they report back, this list is okay, the handful that were bad we've taken out, and the rest is being uploaded. Fine. That's how that works. And then the result of that is you actually get what you want, which is 
a good percentage of the people you send your stuff to actually opening it. And also, so it also will tell you of what you sent, how many bounced, and how many unsubscribed. Because the unsubscribe button is also checked. Right? You make it very, very easy to unsubscribe. This particular, this particular system generates an unsubscribe link that you can embed into any of your text, which is how they get away from the multilingual issue. We just say in French, here's how you unsubscribe. And you say that in French, and then you embed their link. And so that works very easily that way. Uh, but if you don't add that link, they will force it at the bottom of the page. If you haven't explicitly embedded their unsubscribe link somewhere in your content, they will force it at the bottom. Again, to be compliant with the laws, you cannot these days send out a piece of email, bulk email, without an unsubscribe link. In, at very least, it's unethical and will get you on a will probably get you on a, a an RBL list. And in, in Canada, as a sender, that actually can be will get you fined. But here we are. This is working for us. We're happy with the result. Uh, the way you pay them is you pay them per email sent. And I think it's fractions of a cent or something like that per email sent. You buy credits from them, and then you do the blast, and that counts against your credits, and then you top it up. It's like a Presto card almost. Yes? Uh, how is it that the Canadian government, what, what mechanism do they have that they use to detect the are? Um, People are happy to complain. People are happy to complain, and they'll act on complaints, very aggressively in some cases. Yes? Uh, you mentioned a cleaning service, and like, uh, they will forward the good stuff. Will they actually tell you what was rejected? I don't actually remember. I think they'll give you the numbers, and I think you could do a diff between what you sent them and what they sent you back and get an idea of what didn't work. Um, and so I don't, I don't think that's a big deal. The important thing is, is that what you upload to the mailing list service is clean. And in fact, some of them will even force it through their own cleaning service before they'll let you use it. Yeah. I was just wondering if you're, getting, uh, if you're going to a cleaning service, you might want to maintain the well, good list. The French, the, in the case of the French service, Mailjet, they would not tell us which email addresses were going to the honeypots. Okay. They did not tell us. And if you're looking at it from the point of view of somebody that doesn't want to receive spam, you don't want to tell the spammers where the honeypots are, mm -hmm. right? So we could, they, they would not tell us the difference between which ones were the honeypots and which were the ones that were either dropped or bounced. No, they don't bounce. They'll, uh, they'll, they'll be a large number that will just drop and never, and never be received, let alone opened. And they won't tell you what, which one of those were, were, were honeypots. We'll just tell you, this is the percent that was received. These were opened. These were bounced. These were unsubscribed. These were dropped. Oh, and by the way, of the dropped ones, four of them were honeypots. Goodbye. Well, the rationale I have is basically you've got a 20-year-old mailing list. You would want to clean it up. You would, yeah. of course. But at the same time, you still want to try and reach that person that you heard from 20 years ago. So you at least want to make an attempt. Yeah. The problem is you don't know if that person's moved or not. So there is going to be a little bit of trial and error at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And it basically helps to have a partner and a provider that will cut you a little slack and work with you, which is why we're really happy with these guys. They know we're not out to send people mail they don't want, but they also know they also know that you know we're new at this. Now that we've done a couple of these and have them under our belts, we've learned some lessons from it. Hopefully, some of these lessons have come through here. And because I really, it's really nice that people don't have to repeat some of the stuff we went through. Yeah. How do you know when a message is open? Is that because it's HTML mail and there's a bug in it? Uh, the, I think there's some kind of tracking 
that unless you've really gone out of your way in your mail agent to turn it off, I believe will actually send them some kind of message when it's opened. I'm not exactly sure of the tech behind it. I, yeah, I, so. There used to be one in the old days, long ago. I don't think there is anymore. Yes. I, 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 like I say, I can tell you right now, they're able to report with some reasonable amount of accuracy what percent of what we sent were opened and what were not. And how can you tell forwarded the same thing? Is it forwarded and opened? Sorry, opened, not opened, and bounced. Do you have forwarded call on there? Zero percent, it says. Yeah, so did anyone forward it on to a friend? Right. And in some cases, you want somebody to forward stuff on to friends. Sure. In our case, How we are didn't. They detecting that? Again, there's probably some tracking thing that they put into the email. There, we, we know that when we compose a message, that they're embedding crap into it. That we don't know what the guts, that we don't know what the embedded stuff are, and the end user typically doesn't see it. Uh, all I know is this is what they're doing. Are, are they accurate? I don't know. They do a reasonable job. Um, if I cared about our mail, mail being forwarded, this would matter a lot. In this case, it doesn't. But at least the opened versus unopened. And then to some marketers, the really important thing is of the percentage that opened it of your total, how many actually d took action. So in this case, 8% action from your blast. So 36% opened it, and then 8% took the effort to actually follow up on it. Uh, by some marketing yardsticks, that's a pretty good, these are pretty good numbers. Not staggeringly fantastic, but on the high side of good. Uh, anyway, that is basically it. It does have a happy ending. We're very happy using these guys, and we'll probably be doing more with them. And using email as a tactic has turned out to be very good for us. It's woken up some of our community and let them know we're doing some new things, we're doing membership, we're doing new programs. It's led to some extra engagement. So I don't want to belittle this because in the end, although all of this path took a long time and a lot of person hours, in our, in our case, actually money out of pocket because we had to spend money on the PHP developer that will never recoup. Uh, but at the end, we're happy the, with the results. I'm a little sorry that it took this long to get here, but at least we're in a reasonably happy place. Um, any other questions about this? Yes? So will, will, can you work with these people to clean up the, the lists? Will they, can you give them the list and say, um, send back the ones which are good? Or, or and that's what these cleaning services will do. So you can actually go and do a search on email cleaning services. And, and maybe if I took my browser in a second, I could actually do this. Uh, and, and literally, there are literally services. Uh, and I've seen some of them with booths at trade shows that say, give us, give us your list. We'll clean it. And we'll, we'll guarantee, well, none of them will guarantee that it's absolutely free of, of honeypots. But they say they've got good track records. And in some cases, some of these mail services will vouch for them. So I would think with the, particularly the old subscription list, that would be valuable in itself. It's valuable to the extent it's accurate. If it's, if it's, if it's accurate and it has as many people as we have in our community and it is accurate, then you're absolutely right. It's very, very valuable to us. And these days on your website, you have to have privacy policies. When you sign up, if you give us an email address, this is what we'll do with it. This is what we won't do with it. So LPI does not sell, give away, or by any other chance do anything with somebody's email address except to use it to contact them from us. And that's it. Uh, so that ends up being a part of the privacy policy that now every website pretty well also needs to do as part of GDPR standards. So if, if, if you don't, if you're running a website and that website doesn't have privacy policy either inside or next to contact us, you might be running afoul of something. There's a commentary that GTA like specific. Over the years, a couple or three times we've gotten contacted by 
companies that were well keen on doing something for us if we could catch if they if we would give them our mailing list. And we inevitably said, no, no, that's, that's not appropriate. And again, you actually can't unless you have consent. This is these days everything is about explicit consent. You can't say, well, they didn't tell us not to. That doesn't work. So if somebody has to say, I will give you my email address under your privacy policy that says you may give it to a partner. And if people sign on to that, you're entitled. I mean, this is what some of those crappy T and C things that you scroll down and don't read contain in them. Uh, but that's the purpose of a privacy policy. It is not the same from site to site, from organization to organization. You would think a nonprofit, a social benefit organization would be very, very tight about not doing that kind of thing. And in the case of GTA Log, I think there would be an expectation that somebody that would give their email address into a membership list or something like that would not have it sold or, or used in some other way. Now, having said that, there's a distinction between can we have your mailing list and could you send out a newsletter that we will gladly pay for that includes news about you and has an ad for us? Different story. That's where the consent thing becomes a gray area because it's not their mailing, it's GTA Lug's mailing, but it includes something from them. That's a, that's a different story. So had they not been so blatant in trying to break the regulations, they could have done something decent with it. But the difference being is you giving them and they control what they do with the list, as opposed to saying, could you send this message out to your membership because we think it's important, we hope you'll think it's important, and we've given you money, or whatever. That happens all the time. Um, and it's a very different thing from just give me your list. The buying and selling of mailing lists has basically become reasonably unethical just about everywhere. But we know there are people doing it. Just look at your spam, <laughs> just look at your spam uh, basket in Gmail to see there's still no shortage of people that think that you might open something. There's still some Nigerian princes running around buying mailing lists. Yes? Right now on our mailing list, Unsubscribe link, but when you click on it, it brings you to the page when you need to enter your email address. How much trouble are we going to run into If it's just a matter of entering your address, that's probably okay. If you have to log into something and give an account and remember a password just in order to unsubscribe, that's going too far. But what most places will do right now is you unsubscribe and it takes you to an Are You Sure page. And at that point, then that's it. Either an are you sure or here's a list of the mailing lists on our site you're subscribed to. Please manage what you'd like to receive and not receive. But it rarely is more than that one step. If you have to ask somebody to log in and remember a password in order to unsubscribe, that's probably too far. But just taking them to one more page to confirm they want to get out, that's legit. Does that make sense? Yeah. Doesn't, that, doesn't that create a problem that someone can exploit this and I, I can go in and claim I'm Evan. Uh, but then you would have to have received the mail that was sent to Evan because that tracking link is different for every single email that is sent out in the blast. So that is the big difference. So very often when they do these mail blasts, uh, the, the, the mailing link, uh, the link that the unsubscribe link is unique for every piece of mail. And all of these services work that way. And that's, pr that's also a difference between these and the simple mailman way of doing things. Mailman will just take you to the maintenance page and give your account information there. Whereas these will just have a single button on subscribe link which, which is provided by them and is unique for every recipient. So you would, have, you would have to have access to my mailbox to be able to answer that and back and say unsubscribe. Anything else? Okay, cool. Thank you. That's it.